Ladies and gentlemen, our final session for today's symposium is an ARBX talk and panel discussion entitled The Brave New World, International Arbitration and Web 3.0, The Metaverse, Cryptocurrency and NFT Disputes. Given that today's, um, the discussion today moves to technology and arbitration, it is timely to mention SIC's latest initiative to address the needs of tech and IP disputes. SIC has collaborated with FedARB, a Silicon Valley-based dispute resolution center, to create an SIAC-FedARB joint model clause designed for IP disputes. We will be making announcements about this um, collaboration in the, in the days ahead. Now, we do have an interesting twist to kickstart the next session. Of course, no metaverse event will be complete without a glimpse into the metaverse itself. Please join me in welcoming my virtual counterpart, Adriana the Avatar. This is Adriana again, but this time immersed in the world of virtual reality. I'm absolutely delighted to introduce the panel who will be taking us through the brave new world of Web 3.0 and the metaverse. The speakers for today's session are Mr. Adrian Tan, Partner, Litigation and Dispute Resolution at PSMP Law Corporation. Mr. Ashish Kabra, Leader and Head of the Singapore Office in Shift Desai Associates. Mr. Jason Norman Lee, Managing Director, Legal and Regulatory at Temasek. Ms. K. Pogek Basie, Founder of the Mesh Minds Foundation. Mr. Lam Chi Kin, Managing Director and Head Group Legal Compliance and Secretariat at DBS Group. This session will be moderated by Ms. Trey Legion, member of the YSIC Committee and partner at Burdenburg. Ms. Trey, please. Hi, thank you everyone for joining us for our session on the brave new world. And to kickstart our session, I have Mr. Lam Chi who, uh, who will be giving us an overview of the metaverse and what we can expect. Check, check. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I think as the avatar introduced me, my name is Chi Kin, and I'm responsible for legal and compliance at DBS. Um, I just thought what I'm going to spend our time on, just about 10 minutes, is trying to just demystify some of the jargon, yeah, and get into the business use cases and maybe share how DBS, from the financial services uh, perspective, is looking at the issue, okay? So, We've got to actually uh, distinguish two topics, which are actually slightly mixed up together. The first topic is the blockchain and crypto and tokenization and NFTs, non-fungible tokens, all subsumed under the topic of Web 3.0. And the second topic is the metaverse. And um, we can debate this later, but I'm of the firm view that they are two different things. So the blockchain, where today we have um, securities central depositories, or we have payment systems like SWIFT, they operate central accounting ledgers for exchanges of securities assets or transfers of payments. And on the blockchain, it's a different technology which allows us to use many computers around the world to distribute that effort or the responsibility of recording all these interests into each of those computers, hopefully with advantages for speed, security, transparency, and so on and so forth. One of the strongest use cases for the blockchain is in cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all that kind of stuff. One of the ways also you can use the blockchain is you can take an asset, like a barrel of whiskey, and you can tokenize it you can record the equivalent of this barrel of whiskey onto the blockchain and transfer interests in the barrel of whiskey by transferring that ledger entry on the blockchain. And similarly, you can come up with only one representation of this barrel of whiskey and record that and only that on the blockchain and nothing else can ever substitute that. That is a non-fungible token. Okay, so the topic of Web 3.0 is basically the economy or the concept that is associated roughly with blockchain technology. The metaverse, however, is a little bit harder. Kind of this was my first slide for it. 
if we look at the metaverse, everybody is aware of how Mark Zuckerberg has chosen to look at the metaverse. So Meta, formerly known as Facebook, basically says this, we will effectively transition from people seeing us as primarily being a social media company to being a metaverse company. So what Facebook's doing or what Meta is doing is they're taking their existing social media business model, which monetizes data-driven insights on human beings, what they like, what they don't like to target advertisements, and instead taking all that into virtual reality. And from virtual reality, they hopefully will get a lot more insights into the humans and therefore get better data and therefore be able to target advertising in a much more effective way. Okay, so that's the transition that Facebook's doing. But at the same time, you have computer game companies. Um, this particular company, $2 billion of revenue in the first year of operation. Koyoverse, it's Chinese. And the computer game is called Genshin Impact. The CEO of that company says, I hope to create a virtual world that 1 billion people around the world will want to live in by the year 2030. And given that they're making so much money, that's not completely inconceivable. So one definition based around the transition that you're seeing in social media and how you're using virtual reality as an extension of the social media business. But another very different definition from computer games, uh, which is basically talking about humanity living in a virtual world. And that's yet another perspective, which I've also illustrated here. And this comes from Bob Chapek of Disney. This is the one that I like the most. Bob Chapek, in just observing what his employees did in the metaverse, basically said this, it's the perfect place to pursue our strategic pillars of storytelling excellence, innovation, and audience focus. This, I think, really, really brings the idea of the metaverse to life. Who doesn't want to fly in an alternate reality? Who doesn't want to be a king in an alternate reality? And when in real life, your boss upsets you, or if you're the boss, your employees upset you, what do you do? You go home and you kick your dog. And that's not a good thing. But in the metaverse, you can actually take that need for emotional release and release it in a very safe, riskless environment. That is what I feel is particularly compelling about the idea of the metaverse. It is not without attention enormous amounts of investment. The largest recent one has been Microsoft's acquisition uh, of Activision Blizzard. But there are many, many other acquisitions also associated with this. Um, Unity, one of the big underlying virtual reality engines, uh, was bought. And Unreal also, uh, the other big virtual reality engine was also acquired. So there's actually a lot of real hardcore investment going into this, which brings us to a definition. In my opinion, and we can debate this as well, the metaverse is humanity living playing and working in a digital reality, right? It's an alternate way of us to experience what we do in normal life, living, playing, and working. But the other part of the definition that I really argue for is we have to realize that that alternate digital reality necessarily still intersects with our physical reality. We're still human beings. We eat, we sleep, we breathe. All this still runs on computer hardware. That computer hardware has to run in data centers somewhere. These digital assets, they don't just exist out there in alternate reality. These digital assets are recorded in computers, in real data flows. That is what I think starts to create the conversations around arbitration and connection back into what we are here for, which is to just unlock what we think that future of arbitration is going to be. Okay. Let me just expand on this a little bit. From the perspective of the metaverse, you have to think about content, right? This was the Disney story. This is the computer game story. Uh, with Facebook, harder to see how content is going to come about. But when you look at content, the compelling nature of taking an intellectual property franchise like Star Wars and having 200 million people, every single Star Wars fan for generation after generation after generation from 1977 onwards, experiencing what it is to be a Jedi, what it is to be an X-Wing fighter pilot in that virtual reality. 
and also recognizing that content is going to be driven by new creators. So it's not just Disney giving birth to Star Wars, it's also you writing your own stories in the Star Wars universe, or those other alternate digital realities that we're thinking of. Secondly, this point here that I'm gonna make is probably gonna support a conclusion that we're still in the early days of the metaverse. This gives us time to think about it. This gives us time to think about responsible business behavior in the metaverse and what we need to be thinking about in order to make that metaverse a proper reality as opposed to a dystopian reality. Um, when you think about it, right, the technology for alternate reality needs to be giving an immersion experience that is very compelling to the human being. And this means sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. These sensory perceptions need to be conquered in order for that perception of that alternate reality to be very compelling. So you look, all those avatars that you see right now, who really likes those avatars? Yeah? Who likes a virtual reality experience that's you know, choppy and stuttering and lag-filled? Nobody really likes that. So the technology needs to develop more. Secondly, the delivery of this technology also has to be developing even more. Right? In order to experience alternate reality today, you need a rig that probably costs about $20,000. You need very high-end graphics capability, a very, very good graphics connection. You need hard headsets, and you need your, your, your input interfaces. All that needs to be sorted out, and that's really, really expensive. So until the technology gives a better immersion experience, and until we are ready in terms of the accessibility of that technology to the average human being, it's going to be hard to see the maturity of the metaverse happening in six months it's probably a five to 10 year thing. This gives us time. But one last thing to note in relation to the metaverse is actually the digital assets ecosystems. We talked about Web3 already, which is all the digital assets associated with the blockchain. There's another type of digital asset ecosystem. And actually we know this in the computer games already. So you don't need necessarily a Web3 based digital assets ecosystem. You can equally have a non-Web3 based digital assets ecosystem, which the computer games have known already now for decades. Okay, so I hope this sets up the distinction between Web3 and the metaverse. Very, very quickly now, how are businesses looking at Web3 and the metaverse? You can look at it as investments in content. What is content that's going to be appealing and, and noted by 200 million, a billion customers? What is the underlying technology that's going to be powering the content-based experience? And what are those digital assets that will become transferable and, dare we say, disputable in the metaverse? And supporting all of this will be technological and financial interoperability. Financial interoperability is one of the key things here because where are the revenue pools associated with the metaverse? Subscription for content, got it. Digital assets appreciation, got it, right? Licensing for permission to enter into the metaverse, advertising revenue. Okay, good, four revenue pools. All of these revenue pools need to be intermediated. And who's good at doing that? Financial services is good at doing that. Financial services will basically come in and start intermediating these revenue pools, always remembering that even though these are existing in an alternate reality, they still need to intersect with your day-to-day -day currency, your US dollar, your Singapore dollar, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this paints the picture as to how the metaverse is developing and how is DBS then looking at the metaverse we have initially made a call that the blockchain is more current and requires investment currently, okay? So we've actually got um, this underlying theory that the blockchain will power the back office of the future. And to make that happen, we've made investments into various businesses. Fixed Marketplace is our bond platform, completely taking what is a bond issuance process to you, legal, prospectors, allocation, application, settlement, 
all that is now on the blockchain using our fixed marketplace. It's got a few hundred million dollars worth of bond revenues already on that fixed marketplace. Partion is an alternative to SWIFT. Wholesale settlements today on SWIFT, it takes T plus two. Partior gives you a promise of instant settlement on the blockchain. And the DBS Digital Exchange is our crypto platform or our tokenized uh, platform. So the blockchain use cases are much more current. What's going to happen in future? Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Partior is a joint venture with um, uh, Tomasic. <laughs> so you can ask Jason uh, also uh, more about what he thinks of Partior. Um, after that, for metaverse use cases, because the technology will take some time to mature, and again, I think we can debate it. What do we want to do in terms of the metaverse right now? We do a lot of uh, development or conversations with potential content partners. Um, we have to upskill our employees to make sure that both our technology employees are ready and that our normal uh, human non-technology employees are equally familiar with what's possible in that new alternate reality. We're trying to build external engagement. One of the ways to build engagement on the metaverse is perhaps to use sustainability to deliver that message. The basic idea is this. Financial services on its own is not that cool. Nobody actually wakes up, man. I want to buy the best mortgage in the world. You want a house. And so it's the job of financial services to be completely embedded in your house purchase journey so that your loan and the security for the loan is completely embedded into that. That's the idea of embedded finance. It's in the literature. And that's probably one of the ideas worth pursuing the metaverse. Thank you so much for having me. I hope we have a really, really good fun session. Back to you, Legion. Thank you. Thank you, Chikin. Well, since we touched on a partnership between DBS and Tomasic, I suppose I should next ask Jason to speak on the use cases and potential applications of the metaverse, crypto, and NFT. Okay, thanks very much. Um, um, firstly, I'm just going to go through some of the key themes here. Um, and I've been told not to mention specific companies because I'm not licensed to do so. I'm not sure whether there are any regulators in the ballroom. So this will have be on key teams. Um, you know, firstly, I wanted to think about it uh, take a step back. You know, we feel that in Tomase itself, that crypto, digital assets, Web 3.0 and Metaverse, all the good things that um, Chikin has mentioned, will be significant in our lives. It will have a generational impact. Um, and that's a space where we want to be right now. If you look forward and think about what the key teams uh, on, in this space, right? And I'm going to talk about five here today. And that's all I have, actually. It's the time I have to talk about it. Um, and three of them are actually uh, relating to um, uh, Web 3.0, and then one in Metaverse and one in Crypto. But we talk about, again, to, to recap, when you look at Web 3.0, right, we're looking at programs and applications which will help us shift the internet to a decentralized model with open protocol and open standards, right? And move away, a migration away from Web 2.0. And now within this space, we see actually three areas. Firstly, finance, as Chikin has mentioned, uh, specifically uh, DeFi, where we feel that there's like, going to be some significant changes there in terms of removing some of the barriers. Um, and also, in addition to that, we'll see advances in payments and asset management. So that's one. Two, in terms of media entertainment, the first uh, GameFi or gaming, again, as uh, Chikin has mentioned, I think that's going to be a significant uh, change um, in terms of the interoperable games and tokenized digital assets to bring gaming to a whole new different experience. Uh, I think some of you are familiar with the concepts of uh, uh, play to earn. Uh, in addition to that, we also see uh, uh, the advancements in the digitalization of media assets uh, in the form of NFTs, which will lead to new forms of um, revenue streams. Uh, and also monetization of static IP, right? So that's three. Um, in terms of the, the metaverse itself, um, I, my own personal view is there's going to be two big areas. One, it's actually the, um, the hardware which uh, people use to interact with the uh, metaverse, right? So again, we're looking at the advancements in AR, VR, uh, and also body suits, glove, anything which provides haptic feedback itself, uh, which will actually make the experience a bit more immersive and actually combine 
or merge the virtual and physical world. So again, that's an area where uh, we see a lot of advancements. Another area is on the infrastructure surrounding it on edge computing. Now edge computing, again, if, if you look at it, just essentially the uh, infrastructure to allow data to be processed, stored and applied um, at smart devices or local network, right? So it ensures that they reduces the bandwidth or latency problem as again, as Chikin was mentioning, what you want to do is to make the experience as seamless as possible, move it away from Web 2.0. Um, so that's again, the infrastructure for um, these uh, edge computing, uh, it's actually going to be significant. And lastly, which I think, um, you know, an area which actually has a lot of publicity, but I think people don't really understand it, it's the uh, base layer, uh, the base layers for crypto. So if you think about it, uh, the base layers of crypto are actually the foundation. If you don't have the layers, you can't actually run the, the, the crypto world. And if you took a layer one, which is actually the, uh, provides the consensus mechanism, security, and so on, that's actually going to uh, be active. Right now, people only think about Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, but there are other things in, in, in the pipeline, uh, which I think we'll see significant advances. If you look at layer two, which is actually, again, um, a layer or so infrastructure to improve the scalability or efficiency of layer one. Uh, you'll see some significant uh, developments in that. Um, and also, I think, um, cross-chain um, uh, infrastructure of bridges. Again, right now, you have actually um, the most blockchains isolated and they don't talk to each other. So any sort of mechanism to provide transfer of value uh, we'll actually, we'll, we'll see a lot of support. You know? So basically on these five themes, right? Uh, finance, uh, gaming, uh, digital monetization of uh, media assets, infrastructure for the metaverse, and the uh, base layers for crypto. I think that's going to be significant. Um, and just you know, to end off again, from, from a Tomasi perspective, you know, uh, what we are doing, uh, two, 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 uh, two key actions, one, uh, from we are participating in venture building, essentially trying to uh, participate or partner with like-minded uh, entities in the space to develop uh, new companies which uh, and to catalyze uh, the development of uh, web trip uh, metaverse and crypto assets. So we have the example of programmable money with Patio, um, and also the uh, data integrity with Lemetry and so on. Um, and also we are making direct investments and to investments in funds in this space. So it's a pretty exciting time for us. Uh, I spend a lot of time on a daily basis just keeping up with all the regs and developments. Uh, but certainly it's an area where we see a lot of promise. Thank you, Jason. So I think moving slightly from the um, financial and commercial applications, could I invite Kay to speak to us about technology for art and other social good? Yes, thank you. Um, so we have we are five years old and we are a Singapore company that has been focused on getting Asian creators to have a voice on the global stage and especially as we build towards a metaverse for people and planet. And what does that even mean? It basically means that we are in the business of trying to um, educate on the metaverse rather than sell things. So you won't find our company creating, um, you know, Nike's latest 3D digital shoe to try on um, unless they were actually coming to me and saying, well, this shoe is made of ocean plastic and we're actually here to teach our audi young audiences about our um, sustainability story and so on. So in this kind of minefield, we are seeing all sorts of things where there are disputes between who owns what, that's my art, how can you um, create some, an NFT out of that and then start going selling it. Um, we're also starting to see, unfortunately, um, lots of lazy minting, so lots of giving away free NFTs, um, and then that is potentially devaluing the artwork, the, the, the value of the art, artist's uh, artwork, in, or alternatively, um, these are just fakes. So OpenSea have just come on record to say 80% of um, the free uh, NFTs you see out there are complete fakes and scams. So there's an absolute minefield to, um, you know, to navigate here in terms of whether you are uh, um, a creator, um, whether you are um, an AR, VR uh, software developer who is potentially creating cool experiences around original art pieces. Um, so lots and lots of and kind of things to think about, lots of regulations to, that are needed in order to make sure that the transactions that are 
going on and the, the collaborations that are going on between um, creators and digital creators are going to actually end up in building a solid metaverse that is not just full of scammers and fake artists, um, but is actually useful um, and will take us into um, this wonderful scenario where we are able to pilot around 3D worlds. As human beings, we see things in 3D. We have lots of sensory perceptions. And by building digital twins of the real world and enabling people to navigate them, that is going to take human understanding and human education to new paradigms. So I'm very, very excited about the advent of the metaverse, but I'm absolutely terrified at the same time. And we need regulations in order to protect people to go forward safely into this brave new world. Thanks, Kay. We'll touch on regulations a little more later. Uh, perhaps now I can ask Ashish to share with us some of the developments in India and what your firm has been seeing in this space. So I think I share the views what Chikin and Jason said earlier. We are still in very early stages of this renaissance or development or transformation or disruption, whichever way you want to say it. But even in this set of early stage, we are seeing a lot of trends coming about through the use of this technology. For example, the first one is disintermediation. So any industry which has intermediaries which are adding to the cost in the process is ripe for disruption through the use of this technology. For example, in capital markets, my estimation in five years time, we won't need depositories and custodians uh, for any of your IPOs and so to say, even equally otherwise in supply chains and other areas. So any, any space where there is cost being attributed by players in the middle, that obviously is ripe to be sort of impacted by this technology. Um, there are obviously other immediate trends, for example, fractionalization. Uh, normally we have heard for REITs, for real estate, securitization for bonds, but what this technology allows us to do is to do, do it for much at much smaller scale for much smaller asset. So now you can take a building and tokenize it. You don't need to build a whole REIT. You can take a $100,000, $200,000 bond and securitize it. So these are the trends which are currently in play and taking place. There are several other areas such as GameFi, DeFi, pay financial and all, but I think Jason and Chicken have very clearly alluded to it. So these are some of the things that we are seeing in short term, but as I said, we are still in very early stages. Thank you, Ashish. Now to Adrian, would you be able to share with us any meta cases, private crypto issues that you have been seeing on your side? Well, I have really bad news for everyone else except disputes lawyers. Now, disputes lawyers love all this NFT, crypto, metaverse stuff. It's precisely because the rule is that technology is always one step ahead of the law and the law is always one step ahead of enforcement. So we are seeing a large number of problems and disputes arising from crypto and NFT situations. What is the problem? Well, the problem is first, people don't understand what it is that they're paying a lot of money for. This is an age old problem. You would have thought humanity would have figured it out by now. But in fact, there's one born every minute. So you have people who are simply paying stuff for NFTs, and then they find out that there are other NFTs that are exactly the same. And they find out that if you own an NFT, it doesn't mean that you can stop someone else from reproducing your NFT. You don't own the intellectual property associated with your NFT. And then they come to the disputes lawyers and they say, slow, what exactly do I own when I buy an NFT? And this is one of those things where nobody knows the answer. And it's quite fun for disputes lawyers because we can spend months in arbitration or, or in high court trying to figure that out. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is um, we still haven't met anyone who's invested in NFTs or crypto and has actually made money. In, in, in the long term. And so the queues outside the, the law firms are filled with people who used to be extremely rich and now they're just rich. And that's because they have invested in crypto. Now, this, this, is, all, this is all a bit unfortunate for the rest of humanity 
But the good news for disputes lawyers is that um, every time someone comes up with new technology, they start, disputes lawyers start looking for a new sports car. <laughs> so um, I, I, think, I think the main, the main thing I would say is in preparation for all the coming disputes, I would recommend that we all do what Chikin is doing. We all learn and understand the, the technology because the type of disputes that will be coming up for crypto and NFT will require specialized training and knowledge just so that we have even got the language to start talking about the problems here. Just to pick a fight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um. I think Sam Bankman Freed made a lot of money and managed to keep it. So, so there are some people that are out there that, you know, they, their net worth has probably dropped by a little bit, but they've made enormous amounts. On crypto. On crypto. Pure crypto, yeah. So there's actually a lot of crypto bros that I think are in the billion, billion dollar league. So I think that's... The, but, but the part where I agree with you, though, and just for the sake of continuing the topic of the conversation... Um, uh, I do agree. The technology moves first, the business moves second, then the business cocks things up, <laughs> and then the lawyers have to come in, right? <laughs> okay. But that gives the lawyers a fourth mover advantage, right? Why? I think I love what Kay said. Why can't us, as lawyers, try to think about what are these foreseeable consequences, debate them in forums like this, and build a future that is perhaps more responsible than one just dominated by technology and business. And that's why I think I love this conversation. Thank you. So we aim here today to help everyone here get more sports cars, get richer through the identification of issues and the disputes and how to resolve them. Now, to that point, I think um, there's been a lot of press regarding cryptocurrency fraud. So we've read so much about people's wallets who were hacked, um, people going after the, uh, the scammers or the third party, party hackers that might have hacked their wallets. But perhaps what's slightly underexplored at this point would be the liability of the crypto exchange or the platform developers in terms of their duty to safeguard those wallets or those crypto assets. So here, I'd like you to consider a case where there's an individual resident in the UK. He claims that he has Bitcoin worth three billion pounds. So to Adrian's point of extremely rich people, uh, his wallet was hacked uh, such that he lost some Bitcoins, about one million. So from extremely rich to still extremely rich, I think. Now, he goes after the networks and their core developers and their creators and asks them to rewrite the code so that those Bitcoins, which were apparently stolen from him, can still belong to him, notwithstanding what the code currently says. So he sues the developers and he asks them to do that on the basis that they owe him a fiduciary duty or a tortious duty of care. The High Court of Justice in England said no, finding that the traditional elements of um, finding a fiduciary duty or tortious duty are not present, uh, not least because the law currently right now does not impose a duty of care to prevent third parties from causing loss or damage. So I think this goes to show that fraudulent activity and crime in the digital space can sometimes create issues in private disputes, which parties can then grapple as part of the private uh, uh, liability framework. So to that, I'd like to ask Jason, what are some of the other perhaps fin crime and sanction issues that you could anticipate in this space? Um, thanks. Um, firstly, as I mentioned, that's not a hypothetical case. That's a real case. And I think your firm did it. And there's a postscript to that also. So, um, uh, you know, that's, uh, if you look at it in the, on the internet, you can, you can find in, um, I think the postscript to that case is actually quite, uh, it's actually quite remarkable. I don't want to spoil anyone's fun, uh, but you can do your search there. Um, in terms of, you know, again, uh, crypto, I think we have to dial, it, dial back again. I think it has to do with people's anxiety about the ability of criminal actors to utilize uh, digital assets in the crypto environment uh, for crime, right? And we're talking about crime here in basically three different buckets, uh, money laundering, sanctions, um, and fraud. Um, you know, if you look at it and you think about all the publicity, right? Uh, mixers, tumblers, pseudo wallets, uh, non-enhanced coins and so on, you would think that this is a wild, wild west and it's rife 
with uh, fraud and, and financial crime. But actually, it's not, right? The, it might have started off that way, but I think a recent study uh, by one of the, uh, the specialized AML firms said there's only about 0.1% percent of wallets actually involved in crime. You know, that's still significant because the 0.15 percent of wallets actually have significant number of coins there. Um, but again, um, you know, you just want to frame the scale of the problem. It gets a bad rap and, you know, with things like tornado cash and so on, um, it actually makes the situation worse. But you just want to frame it right. Um, and I just want to make this other point if we're talking about sanctions here. Um, you know, there was this whole talk about the uh, utilization of blockchain and crypto to, for uh, Russia to evade the sanctions. That's not really possible. It's impossible to run a G20 economy on blockchain. It's just too um, chunky and slow and the gas fees will cost a lot, you know, and that's something which, you know, Janet Yellen actually has, has mentioned before. Um, and also as the good rule of thumb is that if it was being used to sanction the rusting, the price of Bitcoin will be a lot higher, right? Um, so I just want to make three points here uh, in, in terms of financial crime. One, on DeFi itself, right? The question is who's in control or who's supposed to manage the, uh, the detection of crime on DeFi. If you think about DeFi, how it starts is you get programmers, put code in, write the protocol, and then they hand it over to a DAO with the token governance holders running the show, right? What actually happens after that, right? We saw it again with Tornado Cash, and we had the uh, one of the coders in in, uh, in Holland being arrested, right? And he just says, "Look, I just write the code, right? What actually happens? It's not my fault." So that's going to be an issue, which is open. The second one um, is also, as I mentioned earlier, about cross-chain uh, bridges. That's actually now really becoming an important vector of attack. As you think about it, right? These bridges provide the ability to transfer value across chain. And what actually happens, if you think about it, it's like a warehouse on one side of the of the river where you accumulate all the coins. And now by some extent, it's about 7 billion worth of coins there. And then they park it, they collect it, and then they have some value transfer to the other chain. Now that again is an important vector. We've seen it in two cases, uh, uh, Nomad and Ronin, which has been you know, at least together about a billion dollars. So I think that's an area where you will see significant um, cybercrime. Um, and lastly, just to go back to um, Adrian's point again, after all this said and done, and cross-chain and so on, um, and sanctions busting, what you actually have, the old-fashioned fraud, Ponzi schemes, rug and pulls, pump and dump, uh, all of these things are actually being uh, witnessed on the chain itself, right? If you look at it, I think the SEC has um, AE cases as of May 2022, uh, CFTC, about 50 cases, right? So they're significant. And some of the latest Ponzi schemes, actually there is really little element of um, crypto involved, right? And it, it's actually really, um, uh, you know, again, the old wine and new bottles. So um, again, that's the area which, um, you know, we, I see those three key themes in terms of financial crime. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Kay, could you share with us any other regulatory and public policy concerns that you would anticipate? Um, yeah, from my perspective, um, I was always fascinated by um, a bit of digital vandalism. Um, so I know we don't have uh, a kind of like, you know, virtual vandalism crime yet, but should we? Um, so a few years ago, there was a guy called Jeff Koons, and he's very famous for his balloon dog sculptures. And he participated in a collaboration with Snapchat. And so people could go to a specific geolocated um, anchor inside New York Central Park, take out their phones, and wow, the enormous balloon, balloon dog was there for to enjoy. You could then pose with your friends, etc., and take one of these wonderful photos and videos and lovely day out for all. The very next day, someone who absolutely hates Jeff Koons had actually been watching all of this from the sidelines and then launched his version of this Jeff Koons experience. Uh, and when people went with their QR codes to, um, you know, spawn it with their phone, what did you see? An horrible, incredibly defaced uh, balloon dock, right? So in that kind of scenario, like, who is at fault there? Is that even allowed? You know, should should virtual vandalism, digital vandalism be a thing? Um, you know, obviously that ha that could have had a massive knock on effect in terms of people's enjoyment of the actual Snapchat campaign, uh, the enjoyment of Jeff Koons's art. Um, so that kind of thing in terms of like um, trying to piece through uh, disputes between even creators, you know, that's that's the kind of thing that, that um, gets me out of bed in the morning. Kind of like, goodness, you know, the, there are things that are going to interactions inside this metaverse world whereby people are going to get very very upset and so if if you know to keep chicken's point if from i i just feel 
everything that's kind of bad on the internet today is going to be, you know, it's going to be in Web3 and Metaverse as well, but it's going to be even more magnified. So today's Twitter dispute, or if we had a, a Reddit dispute, is in words, and I'm saying, oh, Chikin, I don't think you're, you're very good, I, I disagree with you, etc. In future, my virtual avatar is going to go up to Chikin's avatar. Maybe it's going to slap him around the face. Maybe it's going to try and spit in his face. You know, we've already had inside Horizon Worlds Meta, they've had situations where people are getting too close to each other's digital avatars. So they've had to make a rule. Actually, no, you can't come close to me. Thank you very much. So all of these interactions need some kind of proactive thinking and regulation to help us as we move into this 3D world. Thanks, Kay. So you raise an interesting point around uh, online harm, regulation of conduct on platforms. And of course, right now, the framework is very much a contractual one with the users signing up to whatever terms it is the platform operators have laid down. Uh, I think somewhat related to that is when we talk about regulations, there's always a piece about regulating crypto assets, cryptocurrency, which could be quite controversial. Now, I'd like to invite Ashish to maybe share a little in terms of uh, what his uh, experience is in that space. So obviously, uh, in an Indian context, the regulators have been completely flip-flopping. We started with a complete prohibition, moved from there to a possible regulation, and now we have already taxed it while they are still contemplating to prohibit it. So there's, there's quite a flip-flop in terms of regulation. And that's obviously arises from their failure to understand the particular asset and also the pace at which the use cases of the digital token, crypto, digital assets are also advancing and the inability of the regulators to keep up with that pace. And our discussions with various companies have been that moment we submit a plan and if a regulator is going to take six months to approve a particular token issuance or a particular type of digital asset that I may issue or make use of, then by that time within that period, somebody would have already come up with a better product. And consequently, the regulation is not able to keep pace. But I also wanted to speak to the last point in or sort of connected one, which was the issues surrounding the misuse. Now, one thing everybody, at least in this room, should be aware of, because this relates to various other aspects of arbitration and how it will interact at that level, is how the technology actually functions. So digital assets, by their nature, are pseudonymous. What it means is that we normally hear that every asset is traceable. But what is it traceable to? It is traceable to a simple alphanumeric code which generation of which is as easy as creating a Gmail account. And that is the birthplace or genesis of the problems of misuse which are arising. And money laundering being the easiest of them. Then we have the Ponzi scheme or the multi-level marketing schemes because there is no securities regulator. There are no professional who are vetting the books and consequently looking at these offerings and hence those kind of actors coming in and playing a role. And third, obviously hacking. But all of these also have a solution through regulation in terms of requirements of KYC. We need to sort of build those up and apply those in a stringent manner. Few jurisdictions are already doing that and are, are far ahead and becoming digital asset friendly, but we will come to that, but I'll stop there. Thanks, Ashish. So to the point of public policy and any potential policy changes and the kind of potential it creates for investment arbitration, maybe perhaps to the panel, I'm not aware of any such arbitration having arisen due to policy changes in terms of tech regulation, but perhaps that might potentially be one to watch out for. And now switching gears a little from regulating misconduct, bad behavior to perhaps something a little more positive, digital creations and monetization. Could I trouble someone to put up the image of the bored ape? So waiting for the image of the uh, bored ape while we're waiting for that. Um, to anyone who's not familiar, this is an NFT, a very well-known one. Uh, which apparently at its peak could cost $1 million. So you're buying a digital image of that, a digital asset of that for $1 million. The baseline price right now is about 100,000. 
And the reason I picked it is not that I feel that its expression mirrors that of anyone in this room, but rather it is to illustrate a point behind the importance of protecting the digital creations. So to that, I'd like to ask Kay to perhaps introduce the story behind the creator of the Bored Ape. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I think, you know, obviously everyone knows about this Bored Ape. It's been in the BBC, etc. But has anyone heard of an Amer Asian American lady called Seneca? Nope. <laughs> right. Um, I'd be I'd, I'd give you a hundred dollars myself <laughs> if, if someone had raised their hand. Um, sadly, she was the original creator. Um, and, you know, she has had hardly any credit and hardly any recognition for her work whatsoever. So that is really kind of like letting you into that kind of whole world of, you know, the people behind the Bordet Yacht Club who actually on when they first launched it, nobody knew who they were. They were only outed months later as the kind of two key co-founders and then another couple who are kind of helping them out. So four individuals who were relatively anonymous while all of these hugely, um, you know, over a million dollar transactions were taking place. All the while as well, what utility does this give you other than dot, 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 status so um you know justin bieber's got one eminem's got one. Oh yes okay lovely i'd like to be in that club um so so far what's happened is that they've had a concert like a normal concert just the same as any other concert with celebrities performing okay that's just like the real world then so there is no real um tangible seemingly utility yet um, they are people who have basically bought into an idea that one day this bored ape will be on the cover of everything, might even make it to the cover of Time magazine, goodness, <laughs> you know, so they think that it will become a brand in future, so there's an awful lot of kind of money behind ideas, and when you issue this NFT, for example, what you're doing is creating community. So are you able to bring together a certain amount of, in this case, rather rich people to be able to buy something that you can also then say, oh, I have one too. Potentially, then I can then talk to, for example, Chikin, who has the, the red version of the blue one that I bought. Um, and together, we might be friends. So at the moment, that's really all it is. And so you can then, and, and that's at the top, right? It even eclipsed something called CryptoPunks, which to that point was the, uh, again, most uh, you know, um, invested in uh, NFT. And then you think about all these ones at the very, very top, and then all of the ones in the long tail, um, which unfortunately are then, as, as I said earlier, being exposed by OpenSea as a lot of them are just fakes, scams, literally worth nothing. For example, me going and taking a picture of the board ape today and being like, right, I'm going to, oh, maybe I'll take uh, Cheekin's red one. And then I'm going to issue my own NFT around his red one. There is absolutely nothing today to stop me from doing that. And then Cheekin also has very little recourse to me. So this is an, an, as you can start to imagine and trying to piece this together in your mind, if this was an actual real world item that I just went to Cheekin's pockets and I said, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna now take it from you. Like that's now effectively mine. And I'm now going to sell it to Adrian. Well, we wouldn't allow that in the real world. So why are we letting that happen in the virtual world? So, Yeah, actually, it's worse than that, right? It's, it's you induced me to lend it to you because you promised to pay me 20% on the value of that thing. And then you sold it to Adrian. And that's exactly what's happening. So I think perhaps one way we could uh, address this is in relation, again, back to the issue of the platform terms and the providers, the creators, the contract that was created in the first place. Now, Ashish, could I ask you to comment on that? Sure. So this is the one side of the actual, what is the purpose of the NFT? But so far as the functioning of all of these players or businesses or industries uh, in this particular arena, they are all underpinned by contract. There is a contract between a platform and its users, which could be your cryptocurrency exchange, say Binance, Coindex, CoinDCX, whichever one, and all the people who are investing or using that exchange. It could be an NFT marketplace and their users. Second, uh, it would be inter -say markets. So if you want one crypto token to move to the other exchange and be easily traceable, there are agreements between two exchanges to allow for that. 
then it would be a contribution agreement between a token issuer and the particular person investing in an initial coin offering. It could be another agreement in form of uh, a person requesting an exchange to list their particular digital assets on their exchange. So all the interactions which are taking place in this arena are all underpinned by contract and the monetization models are all surrounding that. For example, in case of NFTs, the sale, subsequent sale of that NFT will also get some royal to the original creator of that NFT and so on. So again, this takes us to the next possible question as to what then be the best mode of resolving any disputes arising out of the contract. And I think we all very easily arrive at one answer, right? Arbitration. And if you look at the very nature of asset, these are borderless. Who are these contract between? The contract is between a marketplace and the user could be anywhere sitting anywhere in the globe. A token issuer from India could be issuing a token on a cryptocurrency exchange based out of Cayman. These are all borderless, which token is then subscribed to by a person sitting in the States or Dubai. So it's all transnational, borderless, and therefore quite conducive for arbitration. And they do actually adopt. So when you do go and look at most of these terms or most of these companies' terms of use or other contracts which are there, they all already provide for arbitrations and these arbitrations are indeed taking place. So I'm just responding to this. Contracts are the problem. If it is such a straightforward dispute as to me refusing to sell my NFT to somebody, to K, and that's a breach of contract, this is so easy. The problem comes up when there are third parties. So let's say this idea of the board ape. There is a red one that Chikin owns. I have no relationship to him. I have no privity of contract with him. I'm just a stranger. I create my own red board ape, exactly the same. And I go around and say, look, I own this. It's the, it's, it's the board ape. So I have no contractual relationship. What can Chikin do to me? And the answer is, I'm not so sure because the owner of the NFT doesn't own the copyright to the artwork. I'm not sure what the owner of the NFT owns. It is a contract between the person who sold the NFT to Chikin and Chikin himself. So it doesn't bind the rest of the world. So that's, that's probably the issue that we will all soon face when strangers come on and we try uh, uh, another example. We go into the metaverse and then somebody defames you, or somebody says something which is not true, or somebody harasses you. You don't even know who this person in the metaverse is. You, you won't even know how to begin to find out who this person's real identity could be. And even if you found out who this person was, you wouldn't even know which jurisdiction to go to to complain about this person. Where did this harm take place? In Singapore, in the UK? No, it took place in some place called the metaverse. So you have to find the high court of the metaverse. And until that's set up, we'll just have to deal with all these online harms in, in a very arbitrary, arbitrary way. Now, Adrian, I think you've brought up the point of how perhaps traditional legal principles may or may not be suited to address the particular features of the digital assets and the digital economy. So I recall when someone first spoke to me about smart contracts, maybe six years ago, and the person said, with smart contracts, we no longer require lawyers. And I thought, oh, does this person understand what a contract is? Anyhow, <laughs> so, so look, um, I think one related development out of this is, for example, the Law Commission of England and Wales has recently published a consultation about potentially creating another recognition or species of property rights in relation to digital assets with perhaps slightly different rules around ownership, control, transfers and transactions for these digital assets in recognition of the slightly different features that they would have compared to your real life assets. That's for traditional legal principles. 
we're speaking of arbitration and arbitration rules and arbitration framework here. And we've just heard very exciting news that SIAC is collaborating with FedArb in relation to creating, uh, I think, slightly uh, new process for uh, technology disputes. Now on that, and because flexibility is one of the much touted quality of arbitration. Perhaps my, first, my question to Jason then is, um, do you think there's value to having such specialized arbitration rules or frameworks and what would you like to see embedded within these? Um, thanks, Yun. Now from the demand side, I, um, essentially we look on the substantive piece. Um, you mentioned the law commission coming out with your 549 page report. Um, I certainly also think that there's enough uh, differentiation between uh, the metaverse digital assets to from traditional assets to warrant a study at least into developing a body of law to deal specifically with on a substantive part. Um, when you look around and then you think about it, okay, that's substantive, but what do we do on the framework on the arbitration rules, right? And these things deal with very mundane things with service of process, starting proceedings. Sorry, I, I used the word Monday, I should take it back. I, I see Adrian getting offended. Um, uh, enforcement, uh, no, all these type of issues sometimes don't sit well um, in the uh, new digital space. So to your point, I, um, you know, I think you know, there's definitely a place for people to reconsider how you would deal with these disputes, uh, both from a substantive perspective and also from uh, a litigation perspective, whether it's forced in mediation, arbitration, and so on. Um, and I tell you the reason is this. Um, a couple of years ago, pure disputes in the crypto digital asset space were quite uh, few and far between. Uh, you would actually have to uh, trawl through the cases and one case came out, everyone got very excited. Um, but as the, as the space matures and more money goes in, uh, you will see an increase in disputes. That's something which I can definitely tell you will happen. So it just pays you know, for at least in my, my view, Singapore to be, uh, to take the initiative to develop these kind of skills and ability and just to position itself as hub to resolve these issues. Thanks, Jason. Now, um, Adrian, perhaps a question for you. How important do you think it is for the arbitrators in this space to have specialized tech knowledge? Do you think everyone in this room should be running off and enrolling into a blockchain course tomorrow? Yes. So it's important to have training and specialization. This is such a new area. Even the experts can't agree on definitions, let alone take it one step further. So I would suggest that most uh, disputes lawyers and most arbitrators familiarize themselves with the world that she can introduce to us at the beginning. This, this, this world of avatars, this, um, this metaverse where we need to overlay our traditional legal concepts on. So I think um, the training would probably not have to be too detailed but it certainly needs to happen. Otherwise, the first two weeks of arbitration will be spent <laughs> by lawyers going through the dictionary of what is a metaverse, what is NFT, what is blockchain, and so on. And you know what happens when lawyers talk about definitions? They will disagree with each other. So the, the next thing we need to do is probably we need to have legal definitions of stuff like um, an ICO, or stuff like the metaverse, what, what it is and what it isn't. So even before the training starts, I guess lawyers have to agree on what words mean. So I think that is an acknowledgement of the complexity, uh, which uh, is introduced by the fact of the technology. I think on the other side of it, uh, we've also seen the need for speed when it comes to technology disputes because of the need to go to market very quickly. Uh, there's been a consultation or proposal around perhaps tech dispute resolution provisions that provide for an award within 20 days of constitution of the tribunal, assuming that it's all done on paper. Now, with that kind of speed, um, perhaps I'd like to ask Ashish to just briefly comment on that and also on the importance of the seat in a tech arbitration. Sure. 
So I, I'm not so sure on the speed. Yes, everybody would want it faster and faster. And from 20 days, probably somebody will say two hours. But be mindful, the award is also final and binding. So there's always a trade-off which is taking place. So while the rules are coming in and they are being framed, I think we have to also take a cautious approach as to how we go about this and how fast do we really want it to be. Uh, on the seat, uh, it is it is of utmost importance that if you are in this industry, in this area, and if you are entering into these contracts, that you choose the seat in a jurisdiction friendly to digital assets. Uh, we have had a situation already where a court in Shenzhen set aside an arbitral award on the grounds of being violative of public policy because the court granted damages in dollar terms for a contract which was done in uh, crypto assets. What essentially it mean was it violated public policy because under that particular country's public policy, conversion of crypto into fiat is not permitted. So if you see it, your arbitration in not a jurisdiction friendly to digital asset, the whole point of it may just be lost. And to my recollection, Singapore definitely is one of the leading jurisdictions globally. Uh, there are only three, so to say, in terms of when it comes to such type of companies, primarily in the United States and connected areas, Cayman and so on. There's in the Middle East, Dubai, and then in Asia, Singapore. But when you think of arbitration, you only think of one leading jurisdiction, which is there. So yes, seat is of utmost importance. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ashish. So speaking of um, enforcement, crypto enforcement, and uh, how the public policy perhaps in the enforcing jurisdiction might become relevant. Um, Chikin, I'd like you to uh, perhaps share with us a little some of your thoughts in relation to tracing of digital assets and the enforcement challenges. Because, you know, in the traditional economy, if somebody has to freeze assets of money, they go to a bank. How is that going to change and what sort of issues do you uh, anticipate? Yeah, so this is a really, really complex question. <laughs> okay, so so let me let me perhaps just say I think we've had a really rich discussion so far, and I want to bring it down to uh, kind of like where will the big ticket arbitrations be, and then link it back to traceability, right? Okay, uh, I think it rests on that idea of platform liability. Uh, content-based ecosystems, and then the owners and operators of the platforms and the data centers, okay? So let me kind of link all this up. You've got Disney. They run a Star Wars metaverse. It's based on the blockchain. Uh, some of the assets, your X-Wing fighters or the only dark saber is listed on, let's say, DBS Digital Exchange. DBS Bank operates the digital exchange. Shareholder in DBS Bank is Domestic Holdings, okay? Um, the DBS Digital Exchange is running a data center, let's call it based in Singapore, and the digital exchange basically uh, uh, operates a lot of its technology in, in Singapore. Okay, so then there's a big dispute, okay, over the underlying digital assets in the Star Wars universe, and you've got to look for a defendant, right? Logically, if I don't do my job very well, then you look at platform liability, the DBS digital exchange, and potentially shareholder uh, obligations on that. But one thing that potentially opens up also is not just enforcing against the platform, which could be in Malta. Enforce against the data center, which could be in Singapore. And I think all these options open up uh, when we look at this. And this was my point about all this may theoretically exist in an alternate reality where the human being experiences it, but it still runs on physical infrastructure. And that physical infrastructure will still inevitably be located somewhere. Lah. Now, one last point, which I think was alluded to earlier about pseudonymity. So you're right. These assets are all recorded on hashes on the blockchain. ABC123 exclamation mark C25, you know, and that literally is all you know about it. But the beautiful thing, about the blockchain as well, is that everybody knows this went through that particular address. And there is technology that's available to associate that address with who else is uh, trading with that. So when we look for, let's say, North Korean hackers, yeah, we can find them, even though they're using C123 ABC <laughs> as, their, as their front. But we know that that address is used by the North Korean hackers, either from an FBI investigation or from a destination wallet and that kind of stuff. So all these things open up. 
And perhaps while it is a very, very complex question, I do think it will be solved by a combination of the technology and the law uh, in looking at this area. Thank you. So we have one question, I think, linking back to your presentation earlier. There's a question about the link to explore the Part alternative to SWIFT. Is this something which we can share? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're fairly, we're fairly, uh, Partio. Partio is a joint venture. So it's JP Morgan, uh, DBS, uh, Tabasic, and I think we're getting a uh, Eurobank as well. Okay, so DBS is dominant in Sing dollars. JP Morgan is dominant in US dollars. Uh, Tabasic is a catalyst for <laughs> uh, these kinds of things. And then, you know, you'll need a Euro uh, thing, right? Today, I don't know if you know, but in order to transfer a payment, let's say from the US to Singapore, um, that payment, when it's instructed in the US, goes to a US correspondent bank, which sends that information to SWIFT, which then sends that information to a Singapore correspondent bank, and then the beneficiary in Singapore gets it. That process takes a long time. Yeah, That takes about two days today. right? If it's on the blockchain, actually, instead of sending all these messages, so your originator sends to your correspondent bank, sends to SWIFT, SWIFT sends to the Singapore correspondent bank, sends to the beneficiary. Instead of doing all that, what you can do is you can reduce the US dollar payment message into a token. Call it A. And just record on the blockchain that A is transferred to somebody else. Right. So instantly, the whole network knows that that A has been transferred to somebody else. And that is what happens on the blockchain. That's what we are trying to do uh, with this. Now, uh, what's the downside? Uh, sanctions, hackers, criminals, wherever you have money, you've got bad guys, that kind of stuff. So we got to make that work properly and don't screw it up. That's my job, right? And make sure that um, make sure that the future is better than Swift rather than worse than Swift. <laughs> yeah? uh, then we've got a chance. Uh, hopefully that... that uh, I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, there's the other shareholder. Um, as Chicken mentioned, the base case is actually to provide for payments, but then you can overlay a lot of other things on it. You know, a settlement of trade finance, uh, settlement of securities. And I think some of you might have heard in the US, they're looking to move to T plus one with a future to T plus O for settlement of securities. And you can't actually do T plus O or T plus one essentially long term without uh, the ability of blockchain. So there are many different uses for it. Um, and one last point on this, you know, when blockchain first came out, there was a joke that it was a solution looking for a problem. Uh, but I think definitely in the payment space, uh, you look at the legacy uh, infrastructure for payments, this is just definitely something where uh, blockchain uh, as uh, used by Partio itself, um, I think will, will make a difference. In. Well, so on that note, and with uh, hopes for blockchain improving our lives, uh, I'd like to bring this session to a close. I'd like you to, to thank uh, my fellow panelists with me in their contribution and comments shared with the session today. Thank you very much. <laughs>